Church, in this moment, may you and we all surrender before God. Let us pray the prayer of preparation together with our voices lifted high and our hearts open as we continue now in this spirit of worship together. God of signs and wonders, who speaks the world into being, speak again your words of life and death. May your word be ever near us, on our lips and in our hearts. Transform us, we hear your word this day, that we may respond with faithful praise. Amen. Amen. Can we have our praise team this morning as always? Amen. Amen. We just take a moment and turn to your neighbors and wave with a smile on your face and greet each other with the love of Christ this beautiful morning. And as always, we welcome you to Christ Fellowship again. And for those of you watching online, we welcome you on Pastor Ruben Signs. And it is a joy, a joy to have started worship the way we did today together and to continue to be in worship together. Amen. Amen. Today we begin a brand new series titled Inside Out. We believe when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are transformed from the inside out. Amen? Yeah. It's a simple message. And it's one that we're going to live in and be with and sit with and praise with and give thanks with throughout this Lenten season. How many of us in our lives are in need of transformation from the inside out today? Amen. Today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 4 to begin our Lenten journey for the first Sunday of Lent. The temptation of Jesus. The temptation of Jesus. As he would be led into the wilderness following the miraculous event that was his baptism. Tempted for 40 days. Church, how many of us are tempted this day? How many of us have faced a great temptation this week? I'll tell you what, in preparing for this sermon, temptation seemed to be far too near. Yeah. Hear these words from Matthew 4. 1 through 11. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, Command these stones to become bread. Jesus replied, it is written, people won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him into the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, since you are God's son... Throw yourself down, for it is written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hand so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Side note, this is the devil using scripture. Jesus replied, again, it's written, don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. He said, I'll give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. Jesus responded, go away, Satan, because it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve, listen to this word, only him. Church with me, only Again, only him. So word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Temptation, church, is fierce. 
and it comes hard, and it comes fast. Temptation in many ways in our lives is a gateway to sinful living. And it is a gateway to sinful living because of what it implies. Giving into temptation implies that we have made a decision to rely on our own flesh rather than on God. And temptation and giving into it is evidence of this. Therefore, it only seeks to separate us from the things of God. Now, while we may not be taken into literal deserts or wildernesses to face Satan himself as Jesus did, it is inevitable in our human life that we will be faced with both mortal and inevitably difficult decisions based on our own frailty as human beings. Okay? We are human. And we are mortal. And on our own, life can, and at times may be, difficult. And you can hear that and be depressed and discouraged. <laughs> but simply I say to you, don't be. Don't be. But rather... Choose then to rely on someone who is whole. Whole for us. Whole for us. In our own human environments every day, they will produce for us temptations that will affect our character constantly. We will see ourselves formed and reformed by influences of all sorts, both moral and immoral. So the sooner we recognize that temptation comes, the sooner we can then begin to take steps to combat that temptation in our lives. I believe temptation comes in two ways primarily. And when we experience it the most in our life, and a little bit of this honestly is even from my own personal experience in this faith journey. The first is, Temptation often comes shortly after we have committed ourselves to something. Shortly after we have committed ourselves to something. Because the reality is this. Commitment requires surrender. Amen? Commitment requires surrender. But see... In our world today, surrender is viewed as a form of weakness and abandonment and quitting and limitation. A form of giving in. But in faith, surrender is not about these things, but rather surrender, like we talked about on Ash Wednesday, is not about giving up or giving in. It's about Offering up and offering in the things of God. So it depends in which surrender you choose in life. And so when we commit ourselves to something, hopefully if it is in God, it requires surrender. But see, our humanity will tell us surrender will only weaken you. Surrender will only limit you. See, I think the reason why we are so susceptible to temptation when we commit ourselves to something is because of the shifts that happen, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those around us and in the world that, dare I say, is not always for us. Not always for us. When we commit ourselves, we get into these places where, have you ever seen horse races? They got the blinders. Stay focused on the finish line, right? Don't see the ones coming on your right. Don't see the ones coming on your left. Stay focused on where you're going. And the reality is whether you win the race or not, 
If you remove those blinders, the chances of that horse stumbling and the jockey becoming injured are much higher. The objective, first and foremost, always is to finish the race. And by finishing the race alone, you have had a victory of some sort. May not have been the victory you always wanted, but it's a victory nonetheless because you've made it. And without the blinders being able to be focused on where you're going, there's going to be interruption. Now, again, we live in a world where people will say, well, take that type of mentality and that type of focus of being single-minded as a negative. Because then you get called things as narrow-minded. Incapable of experiencing other things. Incapable of hearing other people's opinions. Incapable of expressing your full self. If you live this way. Now there's some truth in that because there are things in this life, especially those quite simply that are outside of God. When we live like this, the only thing we're shunning when we're outside of God, if we live like this, is God himself. Though God's always going to be like running like this. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> but the reality is living like this. And mind you, I think Paul talks a lot about this to the churches about putting on a mind of Christ, a unified mind of Christ, right? This means that by God's standards, in a way, if it is for God, living a life that is here is good. Matter of fact, I mean, you look at the Israelites when they entered the promised land. Don't deviate to the left. Don't deviate to the right. Stay centered on the things of God. So not only is it good, but it's biblical to live in this way. Because the reality is that while we're there, see, that's the problem, though, because while, yes, I want to remain focused on God, look at all the other things I will miss in this life. Let me tell you something, church. Most of those other things that we're afraid we're going to miss, the only place they're going to lead us is down a rabbit trail that's going to lead to another lost and wandering place. The people of Israel went down a lot of rabbit trails, hence why they were in the desert for 40 years. It was not because of bad direction. That journey should have taken them weeks, and they managed extraordinarily to make it into a matter of 40 years. That is a moment where blinders would have been really good. <laughs> to focus on the things of God only. <laughs> only. Because the reality is that the end goal, the prize, the victory that we're running after, I promise you, church, in great faith, in great faith, the reward that comes and the experience and the expression of God's glory and majesty will be far greater than anything that tries to influence us from the outside. I promise you this, and it will not fail you, and it will not lead you to a place of wandering, or even dare I say, though we read this text about the wilderness, into the wilderness, or at least not into the wilderness alone not into the wilderness alone commitment scares the devil when we commit to the things of Christ many of us here have been to all sorts of retreats perhaps camps or even worship services, churches, where we've experienced God's presence. And you feel like you're untouchable. Like you have this aura around you and the spirit is upon you and, and life is different. You begin to see life differently. You begin to hear things differently. You begin to speak to people differently. And we want to live in those mountaintops all day, every day. But the reality is, at some point, we've got to come down from that mountaintop. And the commitment we make to Christ isn't at its strongest in the mountaintop. It's at its strongest when we are down back in the valley. That is where our commitment will be forged and strengthened. That is where our commitment matters most. And that is where we cannot allow our commitment to be derailed by the things that tempt us. Because then that's when we become a people that settle. And say, you know what? 
in the valley, I don't have to be at my best because I can always get back to the mountaintop at some point in my life. That's when the excuses come in. But we don't realize that that way of speaking is a form of temptation. It's a form of subduing that of which God is seeking to do in our lives. It's subduing the purpose in which we've committed ourselves to Christ in the first place. And what we believe commitment in Christ means for ourselves and our lives. And so it is extremely important for us to recognize that in our commitment, we must do everything to not become a people of sometimes or oh well, but a people of always and only in the things of God. Amen. Amen. This should be our goal. Because the reality is how temptation comes in the midst of our commitments. It doesn't just affect our faith. But as I said, those who are around us, it has a long and far reaching effect on every aspect of our life. Our commitments are not isolated when they are in Christ. Rather, they are bountiful and they are everlasting and they are far reaching. And so that is where we should and always seek to place ourselves to remain committed and to avoid temptation. So temptation comes when we commit ourselves. And this Lenten season, church, by God's grace, all of us in here and everybody watching and all those who are going to come, may we commit ourselves to the things of Christ and ready ourselves in the spirit because temptation will come. And it will come as soon as we step out of this place. But don't fear the commitment. Don't run from the commitment. But rather stand in it. Believe in it. Live in it. Regardless of the temptation that is to come. The second way in which temptation seeps into our life. And John Wesley said this best. He's good, simply he says, temptation comes in the subtleness of life. The ordinary. The ordinary, right, for us in our life. Discipleship, life and faith is not always going to be glitz and glamour, all right? Sunshine and roses, that's, that's not going to be Faith always for us. I mean, even look at what Jesus says. People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. Right? He gives this command. You know, you're God's son. Why don't you command these stones to become bread? For Jesus, he was starving. And in this moment, the starvingness of Jesus became ordinary. We're going to go through seasons in our life where we're going to feel as if we are starving. Starving. Searching, seeking, things in our life are going to become dull and stale, or so it's going to feel this way. And we have to be extremely careful in this. Because the reality is that in the middle of this ordinariness, even though we are a people who live in a consumer world where all we want is want, 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 new, 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 exciting, exciting, exciting. Appeal to me, please, world, because my life is dull. My life is, my life is starving for something. It is in those moments that temptation will try to find a way to seep in, to seep in and make its impact on our lives. And perhaps the way we will see folks seek to enhance this dullness and these ordinary times in our lives come through things like alcohol, spending money on new vehicles and homes, quitting jobs because it doesn't pay enough or because we don't want to do the work anymore. We need to plan out strategically as many family trips as possible because if not, our family life at home is too boring and we have nothing to talk about. Even Unfaithful relationships come when marriages or friendships become too ordinary. 
as if knowing somebody for a long period of time is a bad thing. And as if we have reached the limits of getting to know one another. And so these excuses are produced of life has just become too ordinary. Now let me say this. Some of these things outside of unfaithful relationships are not sinful in themselves in moderation. In faithful moderation, may I add. They become sinful and detrimental to our faith and our lives when they become excess. But more so when they become a source of our strength. As if to say, if I don't have it, then I am not strong and I have nothing. That idea is a temptation. To think about that of which we think we need as opposed to what we truly need. Temptation is, is defined in the original Greek in this way. In the quotations. What reveals weakness within us. That's the Greek, the traditional translation of temptation. What reveals weakness within us. The idea of weakness in us comes from obviously a deeper place where temptation is born. And oftentimes within us, those places where we have deep challenges or conflict within our spirit, within our body, the enemy will move and take that and say, I'm going to place a temptation in your life that is geared towards that because that is a weakness and I'm going to play on that weakness within you. What do we do in our lives when we have, let's take physical weakness, for example. When we have physical weakness, what do we do? For me, in my life, personal side, right? I've begun a, a, a weight loss journey. So, so that I could be, away, be around a little longer for my children. And so I could also get down on the ground and actually play football with them. Because God knows that was becoming more difficult. So we begin to seek out healthier options in life. Challenge ourselves for it. We want to strengthen ourselves, right? When we are in moments of weakness physically, we, we seek out the resources available to us. We go to physical therapy. We go to hospitals. We go to doctors. We go to trainers, etc., right? I don't know. We watch uh, you know, exercise programs on TV. I don't know. But when we experience physical weakness in our life, sometimes it takes a little while to get there. But when we get there, we make the effort to seek out the resources available to us to help us rebuild so that we will no longer be weak. And so we can stand. And, and that's natural for us to want to do that. But see, the same goes for our own spiritual life and the spiritual weakness that we face every single day of our life when we are being tempted by these outside things. But the reality is that we must not rely on the things as I've just listed before, but we must choose to rely on the greatest and most available resource ever given. God himself. God himself. It's really quite simple. <laughs> it's really quite simple for us and our faith that the things we choose to rely on and find strength or even to enhance our lives in the midst of the subtleness, in the midst of the ordinariness of our lives, I pray in great faith that we find it in the things of God. And if we find that strength in the things of God, then the things in our lives that seem ordinary, I promise you in faith, God will reveal to you something that you never thought was there. In those things, in those relationships, in those moments of challenge, and in those moments of celebration, in those moments of mundane, God will turn that around and use it in a powerful and a mighty way to bring about revelation and newness and life in not only your life, but in the life of others. We have to believe this about our God. Someone say amen. amen. And it will come to find that our life is not as ordinary as we think, but rather it is extraordinary because we were made by God. Be 
Because we were made by God, so therefore our life has never just been ordinary. Never once. Never once. Your life is extraordinary because of who God is. So church, I urge you, live into that. Live into that. There's a reason why so much, even in the Psalms, they tell us, be still. God sometimes moves in even the stillness, in the subtleness. It doesn't always have to be grandeur and and excitement and confetti everywhere. Like when the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. (laughs) The Holy Spirit put that on my heart right there. (laughs) It doesn't always have to be that, but even in the stillness, in the simplicity of life, in the ordinary, God is there. Rely on God. When our relationships are going astray, go before God together. Together. When our self-worth is being put into question, go to God, the one who claims you and affirms you as a son and daughter. When you feel as if you have nothing to your name, You have Jesus. You have your faith. No one can take that from you. No matter how hard they try. It's inherently a part of you. When things with our children feel broken, frustration, just go to God. Pray together. Ask our children, where have you seen God today? And let me tell you where I've seen God. And here's the easy answer. In you. Rely on God. That is the greatest source we have, church, to come up against the temptations of this life. And Jesus shows this to us. So, how do we combat temptation in our life? Two ways. Rely on God and be in Scripture. (laughs) Rely on God's Word. We will worship only (laughs) the things of God. Rely on God's Word. Jesus, though the devil also used Scripture, Jesus used Scripture better. Because Jesus was the word that he spoke. Because Jesus is God. Hence he says, don't test the Lord your God. That's a big mistake the devil made. He tried testing the Lord our God. So, again, how do we combat temptation in our lives. Go away, Satan, (laughs) because you, we, will worship the Lord of God and serve only him. And the devil left him, and the angels came and took care of him. You know, in this text, the devil refers to Jesus as the Son of God. And this is, I think this is, this is important because Jesus, especially in Matthew, doesn't like to refer to himself as son of God, but rather as the human one. The one who became human. God became human. He is the one, one God. It's all connected. But Satan uses the term son of God. Because what happens when we are baptized? We are claimed by God, right? We become sons and daughters of God. So the devil's tempting here was not just solely against Christ himself, but it was against all of God's people. Israel oftentimes was referred to as the son of God, as a nation, as one, sons and daughters who belong to God. 
And so the whole entirety of God's kingdom, both in heaven and on earth, the devil and the temptation that follows is coming. And for centuries, the sons and daughters of God had given in. And they had affirmed their brokenness. They had affirmed their frailty. They had affirmed their mortality. Hence, why Jesus had to come. And now, when the devil refers to Jesus as Son of God, the devil does it out of fear because the devil knows that Jesus has come to stand in our place. Even the devil knew <laughs> what Jesus had come to do. Watch out now. So the devil and the temptations of our life, they know who's within us. And they fear it. They fear it. Because the devil knows if we take the stand and say, this is where I belong. This is who and whose I am. This is who I am focused on. This is whom I am committed to. In this life, it is extraordinary because of who my God is, not because of who I am. And I know he sent his son Jesus to stand in, in my place where I have fallen time and time again. And in that, I am made whole. And in that, you cannot defeat me. So we can say in great proclamation and boldness and confidence in our faith, get away. Because I serve only God. This is how we live. We may fall. We may fail even. But praise God for the good news that is Jesus Christ. Church, rely on God in all things. This may seem cliche or, oh, of course the pastor's going to say that. Rely on God for all things. Trust in God for all things. He is and will always be our greatest source. There's nothing new that I need to say about it because it is new every time we say it. Trust and rely on God. You want to overcome temptation in your life? We want to overcome temptation in our life? Rely on God. Trust in God. Remain focused on the things of God and be in His Word every day. Every day. Invite the praise team to come forward. Church, Lent is a call in the midst of even great temptation to be reliant on God. This story reminds us that we do not go into the wilderness alone. This is really important. When we leave this place and we go out from this place, we don't go alone. The Spirit is with us. It accompanies us into the wilderness. But so does God's Word. God's Word that is living and is breathing. The journey to paradise will be hard promise you, God will always show up. So rely on Him. Trust Him. Church, I encourage you and I invite you. If you haven't already, we have devotional books out back. It's a 40-day reading text titled, Listen to Him, which is fitting. I invite you to pick up one of those and immerse yourself in it, if not for your own personal devotion, but with your friends and your family. It's a great way to begin. I invite you to go to our website. We have a 21-day reading plan. It's not 40 days, but you can do it twice over if you'd like. Make it 40 days. 
It's a great place to start. If you're unsure how to start reading God's word or being in scripture, I promise that's a great way to start. And with every reading, there's a challenge, a simple challenge for you to do. To live it out in your life. Reach out to us here at the church. We love to offer you resources you need to be able to dive into God's word. If you need help beginning those conversations of reliance on God, reach out. But let me tell you something. You don't have to be extremely qualified or have even a seminary degree to reach out to God, though. I want to be clear on that. You just offer your heart, even if it is in silence. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. This is my encouragement to all of us as a church this Sunday. Let us pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Trusting that you will not lead us into temptation. But rather, that you will deliver us from evil. And so I pray that in our lives where we have been tempted midst of our efforts to be more committed in our faith, tempted through the, what seems at times, ordinary life to enhance it with things that are not of you or habits that go against your call on our lives, we just pray for freedom and transformation now in the name of Jesus Christ. That you focus our minds, focus our hearts solely on you and only on you. That we may, with everything we have, in both the mountaintop and the valleys of life, that we rely on you first. And that we turn to your word and we find strength and we find guidance. And we ultimately can trust in you. Call us and lead us to begin this journey now. Now. Not tomorrow, now. And through it, may we find a great hope and renewal in this season, in the name of Jesus Christ, and beyond, and beyond. We thank you and we praise you. That even if we do go into the wilderness, you accompany us there. You are right with us and you have never left us. Help us to recognize that this day. God, you know our hearts. You know the things we struggle with, the things we battle. Again, free us from those and see us transformed from the inside out now in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of your Holy Spirit now we lift up all things to you now and forever our good gracious and awesome God who is deserving of all glory in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's children say amen